Hello again fellow audiophiles, I am Wave Theory and we've got a jam-packed video for you today because I am going to review the Matrix Audio X Saber 3 DAC preamp and streamer. It is a jam-packed unit that has a bunch of stuff going on, so there is a lot of ground to cover here. So please get comfortable and uh, settle in because yeah, lots to talk about. So quick reminder, please remember to like, subscribe, and do all of those things that you normally do to support YouTube channels. Also a shout out to Apos Audio for sending me this unit. They uh, have asked nothing in return other than a fair review. They've made no in attempt to influence my opinion. And also, I just need to give them a general thank you because they have sent me some things in the past, namely topping gear that I have not liked very much and have not recommended. And despite all of that, they have never tried to change my opinion or influence me to just say good things and they have stuck with me and including sending me this cool unit. So thanks guys. Uh, the link that you will see in the description below for this unit to APOS is an affiliate link. So if you click that, and use that to buy, I will get a couple bucks back for that. So uh, if you wish to support me in this channel, that's one way to do it. Okay, this unit here, as I said, it has a bunch going on. What is it? It is a 3000 US dollar DAC preamp and streamer. Right, so it has built-in streaming capabilities. It has a variable output that you can use as a preamp. And then of course it is a DAC. All right, see the link below in the description to the APOS website where the entire feature set of this thing is spelled out because it is robust. I will hit some of the highlights here. For the DAC section, it is a Delta Sigma chip-based digital to analog converter. It uses an ESS, ES9038 Pro chip. It has an XMOS XU216 controller in it. It uses a Crystec CCHD950 clock source, and it has an NXP i.Mac 6 quad 4x Cortex A9 CPU running at 1.2 gigahertz. So it is, in many ways, a, a computer running and handling your digital to analog conversion stuff. From a decoding standpoint, if you want to talk two-channel audio and what file formats this will play, PCM up to more bits and kilohertz than you will ever need, DSD up to, I don't know, 2048, DSD 2048, it's, it's big, it's big, okay? Uh, it will do MQA. It'll do a bunch of other stuff too, so see the website. For the streaming capabilities, it is Rune compatible, it is DLNA compatible, it uh, has Spotify Connect, Tidal Connect, a bunch of things. So again, see the website for all of them. And then to connect to networks, it can do gigabit LAN, it can do 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi. And yeah, we will go into all of that in more detail in a moment. And then of course it is also a preamp. So you have the option of a fixed level analog output or a variable level analog output. There is a remote control where you can control all of the essential functions uh, on there. It has seven digital filters so that you can tailor the sound to some degree. It has, what else? Again, there is so much here. Let's just talk about how it's built because it's getting heavy in my hand right now, okay? This thing feels like it is carved out of a solid chunk of aluminum. Like, it's not very tall, it is compact, has this really shiny, reflective black top on it there. You can probably see the reflection of my super high-end professional grade end table lamps that I help light this room when I shoot these videos, okay? Uh, but it's really shiny and reflective there. We have plastic here along the sides, and then this plastic strip right here on the back. We have this right here is plastic. Then we have touch sensitive buttons to control the front panel here, like you can see them when it's plugged in. And then we have a tiny little screen right here for a, a front panel display that shows the valuable information. But otherwise, like this thing is heavy. 
It's hard to put into context and communicate through a video how heavy this is, but it's, I think, at least eight pounds, and it's dense. So it feels like it is carved out of a bunch of aluminum. Then they put plastic trim around the outside to round off sharp edges. It is solidly built. Okay, so no complaints there on the build quality. All right, so I mentioned the front panel. I have a clip coming up in this review where I show how the front panel lights up and how to operate it. So we'll get to that in a little bit. So here, let's look at the back. And what we have on the back panel is we see a bevy of options. We have the analog outputs, single-ended RCA outputs, balanced three-pin XLR outputs. All right, then we have an I2S digital audio input with multiple configurations so that this thing will be compatible with a variety of I2S protocols. It has at least three protocols programmed into it. I'm pretty sure there are more, but I had to land on the third one to get it to work via I2S with my Singer SU2 USB bridge. Then we have TOSLINK SPDIF optical input. We, and then we have a coaxial SPDIF digital input. We have a USB type A connector here. And then we have a LAN port RS-232 for, for Ethernet connection. We have 12 volt trigger in and out for powering up an amp if you have an external amp connected to this or even powering up this unit if you have something else powering it. And then we have the power supply input here. Okay, so I'm gonna put it down for a second because literally it is heavy and my fingers are getting tired. All right, I'm also gonna wipe off the top. So if I hold it up again, my fingerprints are now all over it again. All right. Bottom line on this thing. There are, it, sonically, it's good. It sounds really good. I will get into more of the details uh, in a moment, but sound-wise, I really have very little to complain about and mostly praise to give. We will get to that in a moment. Okay, uh, the build quality, as I just discussed, is excellent. All right, the, uh, the feature set is just really robust. Lots of stuff you can do about with it. Some things you need to know before you buy this one are there. It's setup is slow and cumbersome. And again, I have a video clip, clip coming up in a moment that I will edit into this review where I show some examples of like navigating the menu and the quirks that come with that and how tiny that this display is on the front panel and why that makes things difficult, okay? So the setup is slow and tedious. There are some general usability quirks that are different and unexpected in the using of it. They are not deal breakers usually. You, I did get used to those little quirks, and as I got used to them, then the unit became fairly easy to use. So once you get over the hump of setting this thing up and you get through the learning curve of learning its quirks and how to navigate them, this becomes a really excellent unit that packs a lot of very useful features. The DAC performance is excellent. The streaming performance is, is quite good. The preamp performance is usable. It's not like its purpose in life as a preamp is not the greatest, but it's usable uh, if you need it. And so it creates a very compelling total package here that for $3,000, you're getting a DAC, a preamp, and a streamer all in one unit. So it can be really flexible. It can anchor and be the brains behind a fairly complex system but after that quirky learning curve, be fairly easy to use nonetheless, and it's compact. Like it's not gonna take up a ton of space. So if you are uh, pressed for space in your system and you need all of those features that I just mentioned, this can become a really compelling option. All right, let's go ahead and cut to the setup and usability quirks that I wanna show you in a different video clip. So let's look at that. And then we'll come back here and we'll talk sound. All right, gonna try this uh, viewpoint here because I want to show you uh, how to use the uh, the Matrix X Saber 3 Pro here and setting it up in like its menu system on this 
tiny little screen right here, which I don't know if that will even focus looking at my camera viewfinder here. Doesn't seem to focus very well, but to put in a, you know, a little bit of scale on how small that is. There is a quarter inch headphone adapter plug. And you can see like that adapter plug is actually longer than the whole DAC unit is tall actually, which is, I mean, it's very low profile here, but this screen right here, tiny. And this is the screen that you have to use to set up the whole unit and get it usable. So uh, maybe you need a magnifying glass. I don't know, <laughs> something worth considering. But I kind of just wanted to show a, a couple of things here and, and why this can be a bit of a pain here. So one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the unit in standby real quick. Okay, and it does that. And one thing that I've noticed, maybe it's not in standby. Hold for two seconds. Okay, there it goes. When it's in standby and you wanna power it on, we have all touch sensitive buttons here. So you come over here, touch this button. Did it power on? Did it power on? Did it power, oh, there it goes. So like that, that process is a little slow, a little clunky there. And there are a few times where I touch that and I'm like, oh, hey, is it actually on? All right, now let me, uh, let me show you just like navigating the menu. Like let's say you wanna set something up so you touch this settings button here. And then you come back to the screen and like to get the setting that you want, like you have to keep pushing these little arrow buttons here. And again, that text is just super tiny. I don't know how well that's showing up, but yeah, hopefully you can see that it is small, right? And like, it gets even worse than that. Cause like, let me come back here to the, uh, where is it here? The I2S right here to select I2S. So I've got it on the I2S screen. Then I gotta hit this settings button over here again. Look how tiny that is. Like if you have to change the I2S configuration, and I did, cause it started on type A. This says type C right here, if you can believe it or not. Uh, but if you have to change that, now it dropped out of the menu. Like that, that text is just super small to understand that mapping and all that. By the way, in the image here, Garage 1217 Project Ember, review coming up, Cord Hugo 2, I have reviewed that before. I compared these two uh, sonically, which I will get to in the sound section of this review uh, and so forth. But anyway, so yeah, you get this to set the whole thing up. And like, if you need to enter a Wi-Fi password in there, that can really be a pain. Uh, because like another thing that you notice, like if I just go to input selection here, right navigating this my hand is in the way but navigating this like you go through the whole list and then you get to the end like it doesn't cycle back through the options you actually have to go back and all that and so even when you go to enter text in if you're going to put in your wi-fi password or something like that you have to go through all of the letters of the alphabet this way until you hit the end and then if you like need to put a y in, you're like okay you're here. If you need to put in like a B or a C, you can't just go back. Like it doesn't loop back around. You have to come back all the way and navigate back through like that. Okay. So that's uh, another quirk that happens there. And so, I mean, once you get it set up, it's fine, but getting it there is a bit of a pain. Now the remote, the remote control here does help a bit, right? So, I mean, it's okay. Another thing about this remote is that it comes with a, okay, what is that? A CR2032 uh, battery that looks like a coin, which is basically the same size as the screen, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious. Okay, uh, oops, popped out of place a little bit there. Go in. All right, so this helps a little bit. There's another interesting quirk that I wanna show you here, and that's with the input selection. And I'll actually play some sound here since this is all hooked up and so you can actually hear this. So here on the optical um, input, this is on the Toast Link optical input, which I have connected to my desktop PC motherboard optical output. 
Okay, and I uh, use that, I, I set Windows 10 to use optical output as the default sound device, like my web browser and all of that uh, does that, right? Um, outputs to that device. And so on that channel right now and through my speakers using the Project Ember as a preamp, I have... The is about 99 decibels per milliwatt to, according you know, to ZMF's website. Some idiot talking about headphones on YouTube, right? Okay. So then on the I2S input, which to do this, okay, from the front panel, you've got to hit the input. Can you see this? Like the viewfinder keeps turning off. Here we go. We got to hit this input select button here. Then we have to navigate to I2S. Then we have to hit the input button again so that that changes color. And on this, I've got uh, a track playing from the album Polygon Duana Land by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. And I selected that one because they released that into the public domain completely open source, so there will be no copyright complaints. But here we go. Okay, a little bit of music there. Now, I'm just going to turn that down for a moment. I'll let it play. Switching back is different. Whether you switch from the front panel or you use the remote, it like looks a little bit different okay as I just showed you to switch from the front panel we hit the source select button then you arrow over but it doesn't loop back around so you got to use the arrows until you hit optical you land on optical and and nothing happens it doesn't switch like we're still listening to that same song right there Okay, which I'll try not to talk over too much, but to actually switch that, I have to hit input select, select optical, then hit this input select button again. And so now, yes, 300 ohms is, is high in You can hear that same idiot talking about headphones again. Okay, What's different here? I will show you on the remote what changes. I'll back this up just a little bit so you can see the remote a little bit better. All right, I think. Make sure my viewfinder is on here again. Yeah, there we go. Okay. On the remote here, source select button. Okay, so here's this guy talking, right? Watch this. If I cycle through the options with just the remote, first of all, the symbols look different. You see how that looks different? They're bigger. Which makes sense, so you can see it from across the room, right? Because that's why you'd be using the, the remote probably. But okay, that other one was on the I2S input. So now I select that, I don't touch anything else, and it switches. So it's like with the remote, you can just cycle through the options. Again, it did switch. There's the music. Okay? Like with the remote, you can just cycle through the options but by navigating the front panel, you have to like confirm the selection. And that's true in the menu, and it's true with the input selection and all that. So it's just usability quirks on this thing are kind of a common theme, right? So that's just something to be aware of right there. So uh, I will go ahead and stop this view, this vantage point on the usability aspect. And uh, I'm not exactly sure where this will land in the final video yet in the review, but we'll go back to talking about something more about the the matrix x saber pro 3 here all right all right back to talk sound this thing sounds I, I said this earlier it sounds pretty good let's talk about its basic sound signature here regardless of what you connect to it whether you're using usb i2s either the spdif or the streaming uh, functionality the dac portion of this thing is it's on the neutral and incisive end of the spectrum. Signature wise, it reminds me of my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC, which is far more expensive than this one. But like, it's got that neutral, incisive, detail-oriented sound with a fair amount of dynamics to it and pretty good timbre and tonality, all that to come with it. It's also fairly similar to my Chord Hugo 2. Again, this one here, the Hugo 2, neutral, incisive, somewhat detail-oriented, very dynamic and punchy, very good timbre, and all of that. Now I'll get to more of the sound comparisons between these two 
in a, in a bit, but bottom line, in terms of the, the range of technicalities of sonic performance, I think the Matrix is right there with the other $2,000 to $2,500 DACs that are out there right now. It does not sound exactly like them. I'm just saying that in terms of its technical prowess and ability, it is at home and it belongs at that level of performance. <laughs> All right. Um, so as I said, it's neutral and incisive. It does macro detail very well. It has a very convincing presentation of the macro details. The micro detail performance may not be quite up there, so it's, it's gonna make you notice the macro stuff more than the micro stuff. At least that's what my ear picked out. It's also energetic and forward in its presentation. Like, it's not particularly smooth. It's not overly aggressive. I, um, in, to my ear. It's just a little bit more active and aggressive and in your face in its presentation than say, um, let's say some of the other DACs in the price range like Yggdrasil or the Springs from Hollow. Like this one's gonna be more in your face and aggressive than those. The dynamics, like this one, it, it was, it's pretty punchy and robust and full in the bass. Not elevated bass, but it's got a lot of good control and some texturing down there. Um, that's pretty good for the price point, all that. The imaging and separation are not mind-bogglingly good, but they are solid. Like, you get a pretty convincing holographic spatial presentation. That is neither particularly big nor particularly small. Just, I mean, it's just kind of there. Um, it, you know, convincing and believable enough in its size and its staging in both in, in all three dimensions, the laterally, the depth and the height. Okay. Um, so again, good, solid, what it needs to be, not going to be reference caliber on that, um, and so forth. But what brings this one home for me sonically is it has pretty good dynamics. The macro detail retrieval is pretty good and the timbre is good. Uh, timbre and tonality like it sounds pretty natural straightforward and all of that now the the aggressive energetic nature of the presentation is um, probably more than I would like from my primary deck but some are really going to like it it's also going to be over the top for others like if you are the kind who needs the buttery smooth like you match an Yggdrasil or a Spring DAC with a Vio amp kind of buttery smooth kind of a thing, then this is not for you. But if you like that detail forward, uh, give like make sure that I don't just hear all the warts, you point them out to me kind of approach, this is more like that. Not to an extreme, it's just more like that. Okay. So that's its sound from its DAC nature. I did not really notice a huge difference in quality on, on terms of whether you use the, the I2S or either of the SPDIF inputs or you know whatever digital source you use. Uh, the USB input and the implementation on it, pretty solid. I didn't use it a ton because I didn't need to in my configuration, but I did test it with my Microsoft Surface Pro 4 laptop using a uh, audio quest forest USB cable and I thought that the USB input was right there in quality with the other the SPDIF and, and all of that from most sources I think I directly compared it to streaming and the the streaming quality and the the um, sorry about that just edited out a cough but the streaming quality and the USB input quality were very, very close, and I was really hard-pressed to, to tell the difference between the two. That is from my battery-powered Surface Pro 4 laptop slash tablet again, which, because it's, that's not a big desktop PC that has a bunch of stuff going on in it, it's not going to be as noisy. So the USB input on this is pretty capable, pretty good. All right. Um, the outputs, the, the, we do need to talk about a quirk with the, the uh, analog outputs here. First thing, common for this price point, for DACs at this price point that are balanced, the XLR balanced output sounds noticeably better than the single-ended RCA output. Uh, it's uh, very clear that the, the single-ended RCA uh, output takes a hit on detail and clarity 
the sound stage closes in a little bit and the center image gets pushed a little bit more towards my face when that happens. Okay, so that's something you should be aware of. If you buy this unit, you need to be able to use it balanced output to sound its best. Okay. Um, the other thing that I noticed is regardless of whether this was set to have a fixed output level or a variable output level, the output level changed with sampling rate. At a 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate, this thing was very loud, very hot output, even, again, even with a fixed setting, but the relative change still happens on a variable output um, setting. Now, you go to higher sampling rates, particularly you get up to 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, then the output level decreases. Again, whether it's a f set to fixed or variable, it still changes. If you set it to variable output, what you do is you like change the average output level, but 44.1 is still a little hot, a little above that, and 96 is a little bit below that. I don't know why, it's just a thing that happens here. And I noticed that the most when I did volume matching to my Hugo 2 and to my Berkeley to try to compare uh, the do sonic comparisons is it was really really hard to lock in and get a stable volume matched output level because this the matrix kept changing that output level so if you are an album based listener where if your preferred listening style is you sit down and you dive into an album sampling rates generally don't change over the course of an album you're probably never going to really notice or be bothered by that volume changing quirk. If you are, and I'm more like this, if you are a person who sits down and you jump over and you listen to individual tracks a lot and you're just sitting there with however you control your, your, uh, your music and you are just on a whim saying, oh, I want to hear that one next. And so you click on play next or whatever, and you just end up listening to a shuffled up variety of things in a given setting that may have different sampling rates or even be PCM versus DSD and, and that sort of thing. Like then that changing output level quirk could bother you. And it's something that you need to be aware of. I found that it didn't bother me a ton. I noticed it a while, but once I grew to expect it, I had the remote handy and was there ready to change the volume as I needed uh, when it came along. So, I mean, it's just something I got used to. You may or may not love it. Okay, that's your call. Okay, um, trying to think what else I need to talk about for just the DAC there. I'll go ahead and do a sonic comparison here just quickly with the Hugo 2. A being the Matrix in the Hugo 2 is what convinced me that the DAC quality of the Matrix is up there on this level. And this is a pretty high level uh, for the price. All that. The, uh, the Hugo 2 is not, doesn't have quite as much grunt as the Matrix does in the true sub bass. But it might be just a, t a hair bit harder hitting. Not a huge difference. And in fact, all of the differences I'm about to explain between these two, between these two are tiny. Okay, they are on the same performance tier. I, I, I'm gonna keep emphasizing that. Same performance level, just slight differences in signature and presentation here. All right. They're both neutral and incisive. I think the, uh, the Hugo 2 does not emphasize the macro detail quite as much as the Matrix does, but it is a little bit uh, more confident and a little bit more accurate, I would say, in the micro detail retrieval. So it's slightly more textured. It is, you know, it resolves things like room reverbs and ghost notes on drums and like the string actions on guitars and other, you know, bass guitars and all th that sort of thing. The, the rosinousness of string instruments, that zizzy sound you hear when a bow drags across a, screen, a string, excuse me, the Hugo 2 pulls out a little bit better. But the Matrix takes the macro details and pushes them forward just slightly so it can create an illusion initially of being slightly more overall resolving. If you are of the uh, persuasion, and I know some people who are, that the, the Hugo 2 already sounds a little bit fake and forced in its detail retrieval, I'm not one of those people, but I know that some people feel that way about the Hugo 2, then the Matrix is not going to be up your alley. 
Okay, um, it's definitely the, for those who like a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more forward presentation. Okay, um, I used filter one with the matrix pretty much all the time and then the green filter on the Hugo two. And I think the matrix is actually a little bit smoother in the treble, even with the ESS chip in it. It went sibilant and sharp a little bit less often than the Hugo two. However, I thought the Hugo two was overall, even with that slight, and I mean slight, tendency to go sibilant and sharp just a little bit, it still to me had an overall smoother, more lifelike presentation to it. And I kept wanting to turn the matrix up a little bit because I was missing some of that micro detail. And like usually when you want to keep cranking one up, when you have volume match, but you still want to keep cranking one of the things up, it's because that micro detail isn't coming through quite as well. All right, but I emphasize, again, the differences between the two are very small, and we're mostly talking about signature and presentation differences, which are gonna be very much preference-based things for the end listener. Okay, uh, streaming. Let's talk about the streaming quality real quick here. Uh, it sounds good from streaming. Uh, I compared the streaming capabilities of the Matrix to my iFi Zen Stream, which I have a review for, which I will link to down below. The Matrix here, uh, and I connected the stream to the Matrix via the, the coax input here uh, to test the, the streaming differences. So using this as a DAC for both of them, uh, and then use, checking the streaming uh, differences, the Zen Stream is a 400 US dollar unit uh, j j also for reference there. And for the first time, listening to the stream through the matrix, I noticed the, the iFi Zen house sound to it. So if you're familiar with the iFi Zen line, they tend towards a warmer, wider, smoother presentation. And I never really noticed that from the Zen stream previously that I can really recall uh, but I heard it this time in comparison to the stream, uh, streaming nature on the Matrix. The detail retrieval and the dynamics and all of that are pretty much dead even between those two. And it, it's going to be one of those things where the streaming capabilities on the Matrix and the streaming capabilities of the Zen Stream are pretty much dead even in terms of sonic quality when you look at the range of technicalities. They just have slightly different sounds to them with the matrix being a little bit more neutral and a little bit more detail forward, but the Zen stream being a little bit warmer, wider, smoother, and I think having just slightly better sense of space, a little bit bigger sound stage, a little bit smoother, more believable, but not necessarily sharper imaging and separation. Okay, so I say this is a lot. A quirk that I need to mention about the streaming um, on the matrix through Wi-Fi. Unlike the Zen stream, which never connected to my wireless network here in my house, and I have a Nighthawk RAX50 wireless router, the matrix did connect on the second try. I was scared at first. It did connect on the second try, and then streaming DLNA from Ottervana worked great. Okay, um, well, didn't work great. It, Ottervana saw it right away via the Wi-Fi network, sent it DLNA streaming, but there was some buffering issues. I think what are buffering issues? And there was like a couple of seconds of jittering and dropping out when it buffered up a track, and then it would do that again at the end of a track when it was getting ready to move on to the next one. So there were some, I think, buffering issues with the Wi-Fi streaming there, which I probably could fix by combing through Ottervana's menus and changing the delays and there's all kinds of stuff in the buffering size. I might be able to fix that, but that comes back to what I was talking about. The setup and usability quirks of the matrix are a very real thing. So then I, uh, I took what was the LAN connection that I had in the, to the Zen stream got a, uh, an ethernet hub, split that signal, put one of the LAN connections into the matrix, the other one into the, the stream. That worked flawlessly. It connected right away. DLNA streaming from Ottervana took off. 
no buffering issues, nothing worked seamlessly from that point on. Okay, so as I said, there's a lot of ground to cover here and we are comfortably over a half hour in uh, review length on this one and I hope it's not me rambling. What, let me check my notes real quick, make sure I've covered all of the important things here. I didn't really mention, I mentioned that this has seven digital filters. I use filter one for which I think is like the no filter or the, like the stock standard thing pretty much all of the time. I buzz through the other six quickly. There are some differences in frequency response. You can make the treble, give the treble a little bit more bite. You can bring up the bottom end a little bit. You can bring the mids forward. There was a filter in there that widened out the sound stage quite a bit, but also kind of over crystallized things for my liking a little bit. But there is a fair amount of play in the sound there with the seven digital filters, so you probably can find one that you like. I didn't spend a ton of time with those, as I said, but they are there, they do change the sound. All right, so going back from the top, let's just summarize this thing really quick here. 3,000 US dollars, but you get a pretty high quality DAC that decodes pretty much everything you're gonna need right here in the year 2022. You get a streamer that streams with most streaming protocols out there built into the unit that works pretty well. Uh, you get variable output, so you can use this as a preamp if you need to. So three big functions in one well-built compact unit that comes with a remote control. The setup is slow and tedious and frankly difficult. There are some usability quirks that keep showing up that you eventually, I at least eventually, learned to expect, learned how to work around, and then became not a big deal. The sonic performance is every bit what it should be for a unit of this price. I would say the sonic performance is right around that $2,000 to $2,500 mark in terms of value you get for the DAC performance. To get up to 3,000 US dollars from there, you get a, a pretty fully fleshed out uh, streamer, and you get that excellent build quality and just a ton, and I mean a ton, of features in this thing. So it can really be the brains behind a fairly complex system, but making it fairly easy to use once you get it set up and you get used to its usability quirks. Okay, is that it? A lot here. So Matrix Audio, solid job on this. It's not perfect. I would like to see it be easier to set up. I would like to see those usability quirks go away. And I would definitely like to see that variable output level, that the output level that changes with sampling rates go away too. Maybe a firmware update would fix that. I don't know. But otherwise, I really like this unit. It's easy to recommend. It is worthy of consideration if you are definitely worthy of consideration if you can use its balanced output and you are in need of a DAC and a streamer and a preamp in a cramped space environment. Okay, did I miss anything? I may not have mentioned which amplifiers and headphones that I used. So quickly, uh, from the balance output, I used my Vielectric HPA V281 and the Lake People G111 from the single-ended output, mostly connected to speakers. I used uh, my shit Asgard 3 into a Parasound uh, Zonamp V3 uh, to power my speakers. And I checked my KNHA1A Mark II tube amp and, uh, and so forth. And then headphones, my Hi Feynman HE1000 V2. I used the final D8000 Pro for a bit. I used the uh, ZMF, uh, what is it called? So much to remember here. The ZMF Virate Closed, which I just did a review for. Um, I used, uh, just came in, Odyssey LCDX Closed Back 2021 edition. Uh, Focal Radiance, I used a bunch of things, okay, uh, a bunch of things in there, and uh, so forth. So, yeah, there it is. Matrix X Saber 3 DAC and Streamer. Good unit. Thank you, Apos Audio, for sending it to me. Thank you all for watching. I am Wave Theory, and as always, enjoy the music.